Hey, good afternoon and welcome to the Middle East Forum speaker webinar series and podcast. I'm Stacey Roman and I will be moderating this discussion today. We're pleased to have Zonar Chaptai, Director of the Washington Institute for Near Eastern Policies Turkish Research Program, join us to discuss Erdogan, Reckless or Savvy? Dr. Chaptai will speak for 15 minutes then open it up for questions. Should you wish to ask a question, please use the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen to type your question. And now with that, I'll turn the discussion over to Dr. Zoner Chaptai. Thank you so much, uh, Stacy, and uh, uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, assuming many of you are joining from the East Coast or if you're from the West Coast or elsewhere, uh, good time of the day to everyone. Uh, I was asked today to discuss with you uh, the political career of Turkish President Erdogan. I have written his uh, political biography uh, called The New Sultan. Uh, I have recently finished a new book, Erdogan, called Sultan in Autumn. And I think uh, both of these books really tie nicely to the theme of the uh, today's conversation. You know, uh, Turkish President Erdogan, where is he heading? Uh, where is Turkey heading? For that, I have prepared a presentation, uh, which I'm going to go through in a minute. But I think it's really important to highlight that Erdogan is uh, one of the most consequential leaders of uh, Turkish politics. So on to the next slide, please, Spencer. Uh, it's quite significant because uh, oftentimes Erdogan is compared uh, to the founder of Turkey. Here on the board, you see uh, two leaders. On the left side is uh, Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, who founded Turkey in his own image as a secular Western European Republic in the 1920s, following the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, after which Ataturk liberated Turkey. Now, Ataturk's followers, known as Kemalists, after his middle name, Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, that is, uh, believed that the political system Ataturk established, secularist, which became democratic in 1950 and facing the West and part of NATO starting in 1952, uh, that this political system could not be torn down in a thousand years. Guess what? Erdogan tore the system down, uh, I would say, or recalibrated many aspects of the system in under 10 years. Therefore, I think he's a consequential leader. So what I'll do is I'll explain to you how Erdogan uh, recalibrated or did away with much of Kemalism because those uh, steps inform Erdogan's decisions today. To understand where Erdogan is going, I think we need to understand how Erdogan came to power and consolidated power in Turkey. Next slide, please. The first element of Erdogan's success was uh, a Wirtschaftswunder, German word, which means economic miracle, delivered phenomenal growth for about 10 years um, uh, from 2003, when he became prime minister, just about until 2013. Uh, this was unprecedented in Turkish history. Incomes rose, living standards increased, uh, and Turkey just became a more prosperous place. On the left side, there's a picture of Istanbul's skyline. Uh, this is the downtown part of the city on the European side. On the forefront, you see palaces from the Ottoman times. In the background, the entire skyline was built with record amounts of foreign direct investment that came to Turkey during the first decade of Erdogan rule. Of course, you see uh, people from Istanbul called Istanbul lose whining and dining on the right side. So really a very optimistic period of growth and prosperity. Uh, I've written a, a quartet on Erdogan years and the first book in the quartet called uh, Rise of Turkey is exactly on this era. A fact that I like most from this uh, book is that when Erdogan came to power, infant mortality rate in Turkey was comparable to pre-war Syria. That is pre-war Syria. Now that rate is comparable to that of space. So basically the Turks used to live like Syrians on average. Now they live like the Spanish on average. That's why Erdogan won over a dozen nationwide elections until recently, that is until the economy went into recession. So that's the bright side of the Erdogan years, delivering growth, uh, building a base. But even in that era, Erdogan was always worried about the military, the secularist military that saw itself as the guardian of Ataturk's legacy and that had in the past taken steps against uh, his, uh, uh, political Islamist movement known as Welfare Party, from which Erdogan became Istanbul's mayor, a position from which he went to become Turkey's prime minister in 2013 and president in 2014. So Erdogan was never comfortable about the prospects of the military looming in the backgrounds, and he wanted to act against uh, the military, that is. And guess who was his ally? Next slide, please. Um, of course, at the time, uh, Erdogan is uh, a strongly uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, a leader who feels that he's very much threatened, so he makes alliances. Uh, not a uh, lecture goes by, I would say, uh, when I'm uh, talking about Erdogan, that someone in the audience gets up, and maybe also in this audience virtually, and says, 
well, uh, all about all is okay, but what do you think of this uh, poor man, Fethullah Gulen, who lives in Pennsylvania and who has been opposing Erdogan? And I tell my audience, there's only one part of that question that's factually true, that Gulen lives in Pennsylvania. He's not a poor guy. He runs a very powerful political religious movement, not different than Erdogan's. And he also helped Erdogan consolidate power. Uh, how did this work out? Let's go to the next slide and look at that. Um, Gulen helped Erdogan build a court case called Ergenekon. Uh, the name is on the board or on your screens, uh, alleging that there was a coup plot against Erdogan. Uh, this uh, 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 court case was used to uh, lock down a quarter of active duty generals in the Turkish military, many of Erdogan's opponents in civil society, uh, university presidents and journalists and journalists, uh, others came under attack. So democracy in Turkey came under attack in this century the first time, not during the failed coup attempt of 2016, which I'm going to talk about, but in the first decade of Erdogan years when Gulen helped Erdogan create a republic of fear in which opposing Erdogan through ideas was criminalized. So Gulen is, I think, completely complicit of undermining of democratic checks and balances. Uh, this helps Erdogan consolidate power. Let's move on to the next slide. I'll look at that briefly. Uh, of course, um, Erdogan's inflection point in his career, I think, uh, uh, when he's becoming a more autocratic leader, is really around 2010 and 11. In 2010, he passed an amendment to the Constitution with significant support from Gulen owned media. That allows him now to appoint a majority of judges to the high courts without a confirmation process eliminating judicial independence. And of course, the next year, the military's top brass resigned in mass, recognizing that the indefinite uh, detentions of top brass generals had worked and the military was now telling Erdogan and Gulen, you guys have won. At that stage, I think what happened was Erdogan and Gulen each wanted to run Turkey by themselves. What ensued was a raw power struggle that culminated in the 2016 coup attempt in which Gulen, Gulen aligned officers played a key role. So clearly we're kind of seeing a Turkey that's going from optimism for about a decade of economic growth and prosperity and good international ties uh, to a country that's now uh, gonna do things differently. Let's move on to the next slide and look at how things change in the foreign policy. Taking stock with Turkey's phenomenal economic growth, a record in Turkish history, uh, de facto end of accession talks with the European Union. I'm happy to deal with the EU uh, part of this conversation in the Q&A. Um, in other words, the EU is not treating Turkey's accession seriously. This is allowing Erdogan to turn away from the EU to the Middle East. And of course, taking stock with Arab uprisings, Erdogan started to launch foreign policy initiatives, breaking with US and other NATO allies and EU countries when and if necessary. Uh, this is around 2011, 2012, Turkey getting involved in the up uprisings in Egypt and other countries. Again, happy to discuss these in the Q&A as well. But I really wanna bring it to Syria because that's where foreign policy challenges will mount for Erdogan. Uh, let's move on to the next slide, please. Syria is a big issue because from the very beginning, Erdogan involved uh, Turkey in the war there to oust the Assad regime. Uh, but with the rise of ISIS, the United States decided that the primary threat from Syria was not Assad, was ISIS. And Washington allied with a Kurdish group called YPG, People's Protection Forces, which is an offshoot of another Kurdish group called Kurdistan Workers' Party, PKK, in order to fight ISIS. The problem, uh, the PKK is a terror designated entity, not just by US, but, uh, but Turkey and all NATO allies. And on top of it, of course, its offshoot uh, is now a US ally in which the US has uh, made an alliance with an offshoot of a terror group to fight another terror group. Turkey never accepted this policy. Turkey has always considered PKK to be an existential enemy. And this is issue that has now become a very serious, uh, uh, you know, uh, I would say discord uh, cause, uh, cause for discord in US-Turkish ties, but other issues will come in to complicate US-Turkish relations in Syria. Next slide, please. One of these, of course, is uh, the Syrian intervention in Syria. In 2015, Putin deployed troops to Syria. Now, uh, I mentioned that I've written a quartet on Erdogan. The foreign policy piece of this quartet known as Erdogan's empire is the foreign policy piece. It basically looks at uh, Turkish-Russian ties and other topics. And I have counted in uh, my book, uh, that uh, uh, from the time they became neighbors until the collapse of the Russian empire in 1917, the Ottomans and Russians fought 17 major wars. Guess who started these wars overall? Uh, the Russians. Guess who lost them overall? The Turks. So in Syria, 
it looked like the 18th war was going to start and you did not need a crystal ball to figure out uh, who would win. Very dangerous for Turkey, but then things changed. I just want to the next slide. Uh, the coup attempt against Erdogan that I mentioned earlier in which Gulen aligned officers played a significant role. Uh, the coup was thwarted, thankfully, because many of Turkey's citizens rejected the coup, including those who opposed Erdogan, and uh, the uh, attempt was uh, defeated. You see a picture of the Turkish parliament bombed on the left by coup plotters, by airplanes, and you see civilians taking over tanks on the right. The coup was very traumatic for Erdogan. Uh, you know, uh, this was indeed a nefarious plot. And while many of Turkey's Western allies at the time sat on their hands, kind of trying to see how things would unfold, Putin made a really smart for Russia and a strategic decision uh, globally. He reached out to Erdogan at the first phone call that came to Erdogan from a major leader was not from President Obama at the time. It was uh, not from NATO Secretary General. It was from Russia's leader. Uh, imagine the leader of Turkey's historic nemesis is reaching out to Erdogan to say, uh, how is everything? Can I help you? Therefore, it's not surprising that Erdogan's first visit after the coup was not to Brussels for a NATO summit, sub, summit of support. It was not to Washington, but it was to Moscow. Next slide, uh, to actually Russia. Next slide, please. This is to St. Petersburg. Uh, very significant, right? Not Russia's uh, contemporary capital, but its imperial capital. Uh, the significance of this, I think, by Vladimir Putin is to, telling, to tell Erdogan, look, my predecessor, Catherine the Great, who built this palace, Konstantinovsky Palace in St. Petersburg, where we're meeting, is also the Russian Tsar or Tsarina who started the tradition of bullying you Turks. I, Putin the Great, can end this. Let's have a deal. This was a handshake. I think Putin reached out to Erdogan, uh, offering him soft power sharing deals in Syria and Libya, but also becoming his protector. And of course, um, Putin's platitudes don't come for free. <clears throat> Uh, the biggest issue in U.S.-Turkish ties now, from the U.S. perspective, is Turkey's purchase of Russian-made S-400 missile defense system for which Turkey has been sanctioned uh, on the Hill. If you ask me, you said, Soner, when did Putin first angle this offer to sell Erdogan this missile defense system? I would say at this meeting at the Konstantinovsky Palace, where Putin decides, he tells Erdogan he's going to support Erdogan, uh, he's going to back him, but of course, that means now Erdogan has to purchase this defense, missile defense system, which is a permanent uh, fissure. So Putin is a very smart, almost like a 3D chess player, right? He peels Turkey away from the US, he creates a fissure point in the relationship, and he also uh, wins Erdogan's heart. Uh, but doesn't mean, of course, Russia and Turkey are allies. The two countries have many differences, about which I'll talk in a little bit. Uh, let's go on to the next slide, because I do want to wrap up. Um, of course, Putin and uh, Turkey and uh, Russia are now in tenuous power sharing deals in Syria, in Libya, in South Caucasus. These are tenuous because they're not firm. You know, there's always conflict. Uh, the two sides do engage in military escalation occasionally. So all of these are exposure points for Turkey because if uh, Turkey doesn't go along with Russia's game in one of these theaters, let's say Syria, Putin can easily undermine Turkey in another theater in Libya. And Erdogan thrives on his global strongman image domestically. So a Russian escalation would of course hurt Erdogan's image uh, tremendously at home. And he has many other challenges at home. Uh, let's move on to the next slide and review these before I finish. Russia is one of them. This is ironic because I explained to you how strongly bonded Erdogan and Putin have become since 2016, but it doesn't mean Turkey and Russia are allies. They have many differences. East Med, Cyprus, Crimea, uh, the next of Crimea, Black Sea issues, Ukraine, on all of these, Turkey and Russia are opposing sides. And even where they are on the same side, they have many differences, uh, such as in Syria and Libya. Refugees, another big challenge for Erdogan. Uh, Turkey already hosts 4 million refugees. It's the largest refugee hosting nation in the world. Turkey's population is 84 million people. So that means refugees constitute 5% of Turkey's population. Uh, this is quite significant. It would be cool enough the United States getting uh, 18 million refugees in about a decade. Uh, Turkey should be uh, commended for extending a really warm welcome to these refugees with little international support, of course, for about a 10 years uh, period. But that welcome is now wearing thin because the economy in Turkey is in bad shape. The economy went into recession in 2018. Uh, it's the, uh, the first time under Erdogan after a break, uh, record-breaking 15-year period. It's, that is the main reason why Erdogan lost, or his candidates lost elections for uh, mayoral elections for Istanbul, Ankara, other big cities. 
The economy has exited recession, but it's only showing signs of slow growth. And Erdogan's base is simply imploding. Opinion polls are showing his party at around 30, 35%. Even with allies, he's not able to get to 50% that's required for him to win the next elections in 2023. Right now, what Erdogan wants to do is to deliver strong growth for which he has to maintain good ties with the United States and European Union. But he also has to balance other actors. Let's move on to the next slide. I kind of want to give you a sense of Erdogan's world. So he needs to get along with West, that is with Europe and the United States and uh, NATO, uh, because uh, notwithstanding Erdogan's efforts to recast Turkey's identity uh, politically uh, and erase the walls between religion and government, Turkey's economy is completely integrated to that of Europe uh, because of customs union in place between Turkey and the European Union since 1995. And as a resource poor country, Turkey needs to have good ties with the United States so that global investors will feel comfortable to put their money into Turkey. Erdogan has to get along also with Russia. He wants to avoid trade and tourism sanctions that could target Turkey's economic recovery. Remember, he needs really strong growth to win the next elections, strong meaning nearing double digits. He wants to get along with China because he wants to break ground with some mega construction projects, including Canal Istanbul, uh, it will be a waterway running parallel to the Bosphorus, funding will, which uh, will probably come from China. And now, of course, he's trying to make up with Arab majority states and Israel, with which Turkey's tide had, had collapsed uh, during the uh, uh, Arab uprisings. So he has a tall order uh, to accomplish, but Erdogan is also quite an astute politician. I would not uh, rule out the possibility of Erdogan managing all these relationships at the same time. Uh, ultimately, whether or not he wins the next elections in Turkey, uh, depends on economic growth. Uh, Erdogan is a, a bright side, uh, which we have discussed, uh, the quite phenomenal growth that he has delivered. He also has the dark side. He is a nativist populist leader. He demonizes, brutalizes, and cracks down on demographics unlikely to vote for him. So he has a very robust and strong opposition uh, constituted by groups demonized and brutalized by him. They want to vote him out. Uh, opposition does not have a unified leader yet, but numerically right now, opposition parties seem to be in the lead. Uh, uh, elections are in 2023. There's a chance they could be early, but all of that we can discuss in the Q&A. With that, I want to wrap up and move on to the next slide and then turn on to you, Stacey, for any questions or comments. All right, thank you so much. We have quite a few questions coming in, um, multiple ones regarding NATO. Uh, Mark Hager asked, why have NATO countries allowed Turkey to remain a member of NATO? Oh, uh, good question. Well, NATO is not a club of democracies. It's not the European Union. You know, Greece and Portugal became NATO members when they were dictatorships. Uh, I'm not saying Turkey is a dictatorship. Uh, it has three uh, elections and Erdogan could be voted out. Uh, Erdogan is an autocrat, uh, but I think that uh, NATO leaders never look at the country's democratic records when they decide if they're going to keep a country in NATO. And you know what? Uh, in Turkey out of NATO. Also, uh, there's no mechanism to kick a country out of NATO. Uh, it wasn't constituted like that. And even if there was a mechanism, even if it made you feel good, what would you get out of it? Uh, Turkey would become closer to Russia uh, and it would become a more of a spoiler. I think that the for this administration and previous ones, the benchmark has always been, and I support that, is to keep Turkey in NATO while Erdogan is on the scene. Uh, because uh, obviously Turkey's neighborhood, it uh, borders Iran, Iraq, Syria, Russia across the Black Sea and formerly ISIS held territories means that whatever US policies are regarding those four states and one entity, Iran, Iraq, Syria, Russia, and ISIS, they're easier with Turkey on board, much less cumbersome, much less costly. So I think there's great benefit to the United States of having Turkey uh, inside NATO. And I'm a big proponent of uh, you know, keeping that relationship as the bedrock of US Turkish ties going forward. Wonderful, thank you. Lawrence Jaffe asks, uh, this may be counterfactual, but had the EU agreed to Turkey's entry, might Erdogan's story have turned out differently? Uh, great question. You know, I, I gave you guys inflection points. I said, look, one inflection point is Erdogan uh, takes over courts. I think that's dangerous for any leader, however good their intentions are. If you eliminate checks and balances, you know, ultimately power, I think, goes into people's heads and they stop uh, paying less and less attention to uh, democratic traditions and norms. That has been the case in uh, Turkey with Erdogan. But I believe EU accession is an external inflection point. 
<coughs> sorry, in the sense that Erdogan uh, was given a EU path in 2005 when Turkey started the accession talks, that did not really seem to be fair. You know, it had loopholes, it had specific Turkey, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, spe Turkey specific criteria, which made it look like Turkey's accession would never come forward. I'll give you an example. Turkey and started start, uh, Croatia started the accession talks at the same time in 20, uh, 2005. Croatia very deservedly joined the European Union in 2013. Great country. I've been there, speak their language. Turkey's accession is nowhere near that of Croatia's. Uh, uh, you know, I, I was doing this lecture uh, a few weeks ago uh, for, for a group of students. Uh, someone asked me the same question, and I told them that. There's about 200,000 pages of EU legislation that Turkey and the European Union have to negotiate and implement before Turkey can join the Union. And they said, how much of it has Turkey finished with the European Union? And I said, only one and a half pages. So even if you want accession to move forward, it does not look realistic. EU has not given Turkey the, the fair treatment. From the very beginning, European leaders said that even if Turkey fulfilled all their criteria for accession, uh, this was still an open-ended process. And because the EU gave Erdogan a way out, I think it allowed Erdogan to pivot Turkey away, uh, the European Union, more easily. Now, had the EU uh, given Turkey a clear accession uh, path, you know, with an end date or, a, or entry date to the European Union, it would have been more difficult, I think, for Erdogan to pivot away uh, from the European Union accession process. So I would say, yes, it takes it to tango. Uh, perhaps Erdogan dropped the ball on EU accession as well. But I think in this regard, the blame also goes to uh, the two largest countries in the EU, France and Germany, that treated Turkey's accession differently uh, than other countries and still do it to the state. And what, what Erdogan has done instead is he has uh, responded to this transactional uh, way the European leaders approach Turkey by transactionalizing Turkish EU ties. So right now it's uh, fair to say that there are uh, Turkish EU talks are de facto dead. Uh, they're not going anywhere. But the EU relies on Turkey to prevent refugee flows and uh, illegal uh, migra uh, mig mig migratory flows. And as a result of that, I think for a very long time, Turkey has more leverage over the EU uh, than the EU has over Turkey. Understood, thank you. Uh, Huki Walker asks, what considerations governed Erdogan's reaction to the Arab Spring in Syria? Uh, great question. So the Arab uprisings really started as you know, in Tunisia, in the beginning, Erdogan was not too crazy to jump on board. He hesitated a little bit. And he actually worked with the United States in Egypt when the Mubarak uh, government there fell. Uh, but Erdogan's policies uh, changed when the Arab uprising ar arrived at Turkey's doorstep in uh, Syria. Uh, Erdogan believed at the time with his uh, foreign minister turned prime minister, Ahmed Davutoglu, the architect of Turkey's Arab uprisings policy that by intervening on behalf of the rebels and supporting them politically and then militarily, Turkey could shape the outcome of events in Syria. Now, uh, Turkey has a very powerful military, very strong institutions. This was not unreachable, the goal of shaping the outcome of the events in Syria, but not without securing firm support of the United States. I think that's where Erdogan and his foreign minister, uh, turned prime minister, Davutoglu failed. They failed to read that for President Obama, there was no way he was going to get the US involved in a war in a Muslim majority country. Having come to power on a platform of ending wars in Muslim majority countries or not getting into new wars, it was unthinkable that Obama would agree to support Turkey militarily in Syria. And I think because Erdogan misread US intentions, he, uh, he thought the US would follow from behind if Turkey went in forcefully supporting the rebels. That never happened. Uh, that left Turkey ultimately alone against its historic nemesis, Russia, and its competitor in the region, Iran, Turkey's competitor, that is. And that's why at a, uh, it almost looked for a while in 2015 that Turkey was going to lose the war in Syria because Russian deployment changed the balance of power. Russia gave Assad quite a superior air force that Assad used to decimate the rebels. Uh, that triggered the refugee crisis of 2015, by the way, Russian deployment. Uh, uh, things look really bad for Erdogan, uh, but uh, the post-coup, uh, failed coup outreach by Putin to Erdogan changed uh, the calculus in Syria, meaning uh, Putin basically told Erdogan, you don't have to worry about me, uh, just don't fight Assad, uh, go fight the YPG. 
So clearly, the Syrian war shows how you have multi layers of foreign policy moves, right? Uh, first, Erdogan thinks the U.S. is going to support Turkey. Uh, then the U.S., of course, does not support Turkey. Turkey is left alone. It looks like it's going to be overwhelmed by Russia. Uh, but then the coup attempt happens, and Turkey and Russia patch up their differences, at least in Syria. And that gives a kind of a sustainable, if that is the word, balance of power in Syria. Sustainable uh, only in quotes because it's a horrific humanitarian crisis, uh, what has happened in Syria, of course. Thank you. And you brought up Iran there. Andrew Rose Marine asks, uh, if Israel bombs Iranian nuclear facilities, how would I, uh, Erdogan react? Uh, publicly, I think Turkey would react to this and say this is unacceptable. But uh, Turkey and Iran are not uh, uh, you know, in love with each other. They're historic rivals. Uh, I described earlier the Turkish-Russian relationship. I said that the two countries are each other's nemesis notwithstanding the current warm ties between Erdogan and Putin, they have many differences. Now, Turkish-Iranian relations are different. Iran is not a nemesis for Turkey. I would say Turkey and Iran are more like competitors. You know, they're both former imperial powers, both hegemonic, uh, both want to influence uh, outcome of events in the region, but they're also competitors who will not fight. Uh, the Turkish-Iranian border, I'm a map nurse, I would love to share this detail with you guys. It's the oldest permanent border in the Middle East. It was drawn in 1639, uh, excluding minor land swaps. The border has not changed, which makes it the third oldest border in the world after the Spanish, French, and Spanish-Portuguese borders. Why have Turkey and Iran not fought major wars or why have, hasn't their border changed since the 17th century? Because the two countries decided in early 17th century that they had ended up in a pre-modern version of what is called MAD, mutually assured destruction. That is, if they fought, they would not only destroy the other side, but they too, themselves would be destroyed in the process. So I would say Turkey has therefore avoided conflict with Iran. Iran has avoided conflict with Turkey, but it doesn't mean that if Iran's military capabilities are undermined, Turkey will shed tears over this. Uh, Turkey will oppose it, condemn it, uh, but probably not be very, very unhappy about it uh, overall, uh, should Iran uh, become a weaker uh, actor in Middle East politics in the long term. Understood. Uh, Janet Potter asks, what caused the 2018 recession in Turkey and how can that be turned around? Uh, good question. 2018 recession was basically driven by a number of things, economic mismanagement, uh, um, uh, and also the end of uh, investment coming to Turkey. The first 10 years of Erdogan rule, this phenomenal growth was mainly underwritten by quite uh, uh, record amounts of foreign direct investment that came to Turkey. Uh, that money dried off with unfortunate terror attacks by ISIS and PKK on Turkey. And at this moment, economic models switch from uh, actual uh, FDI to hot money coming into Istanbul's stock market. That also dried up around 2018 with increased instability and economic mismanagement and resulted in the 2018 uh, crisis. Uh, Erdogan's current hopes are to take Turkey out of economic crisis by jumpstarting the economy through mega projects. Uh, Canal Istanbul, uh, the waterway that would run parallel to the Bosphorus is one of these projects. It will be the largest construction project in the history of modern Turkey. And of course, very few countries can fund such a, a, a gigantic uh, undertaking. Uh, China is one of them. And that's actually one of the reasons I think why Erdogan wants to uh, get along with China together with everybody else. Thank you for that. Uh... One question, how popular is Erdogan? Is there any strong political opposition to him coming up in the 2023 elections? Absolutely, and I, do we have time for more or I think one minute, so I'm just gonna use my time well to answer this as a final question. So Erdogan's popularity is at an all time low. Uh, uh, you know, he reached almost 50% at the height of his popularity. Uh, now opinion polls show his party together with his allies hovering at 40, 45%. So that means in a two way race, opposition could win. Uh, it all depends on the effectiveness of the opposition to remain as a united bloc, uh, then they can vote Erdogan out. And so far, the opposition is also missing a unifying leader. There are a number of leaders that uh, you, can, uh, you can look up, uh, mayors of big cities, uh, uh, Turkish nationalist E-party leader Akshener, her faction is uh, rising in opinion polls. So he has quite a few challengers. I am uh, a big uh, fan of... Uh, uh, you know, following Turkey, I've uh, studied this country for about 20 years. I'm always fascinated by it. I think that if countries could be vegetables, 
Turkey will be the analytical onion. It never has a core. You know, you think you got to the core and you understand Turkey and something appears there and basically says, wait a minute, there's more to this country that you think there is. So I would say uh, never rule out a democratic future for Turkey or the prospects of a democratic comeback, given that Turkey has had free and fair elections since 1950, longer than has had Spain. It has a very strong democratic opposition, civil society, and democratic resilience. I think that's Erdogan's biggest challenge, more than the foreign policy challenges. Um, if the lesson of Iraq and Afghanistan to us is that it takes very long time and a lot of money to build a democracy, the lesson of Turkey under Erdogan is the opposite. It also takes a really long time to kill a democracy. So I have a lot of hope in, the, uh, uh, in, in, in a future democratic Turkey. And I think we're seeing some of these dynamics already in place. Thank you. And before we go, can you just remind our viewers where we can find some more of your work? Absolutely. Uh, you can find my work uh, at the website of the Washington Institute for Nearest Policy. Uh, that's washingtoninstitute.org. And you can also look up my new book, Sultan in Autumn. I hope Spencer was able to type that into the chat box so you guys can download. And that is uh, available also on my website at chopdie.com. That'd be my last name, uh, C-A-G-A-P as in Peter, T as in Tom, A-Y.com. I hope to see everyone again soon and stay in touch. You can also look me up on Twitter and LinkedIn. Wonderful. Thank you so much. We've come to the close of our webinar. Thank you again, Dr. Choptai, for speaking with us today. Thanks for hosting me, uh, Stacey. And thanks, everyone, for coming. It was a great conversation. <laughs> of course. For our viewers and listeners, please be on the lookout for our weekly webinars offering email coming out over the weekend. Thank you all for joining us, and I hope you have a wonderful day. <laughs>